Forgiveness, um, uh, in one sense, we can think of uh, uh, forgiveness um, when I, uh, my name went down for this uh, topic. Um, the more you look at it, um, the deeper it gets. And uh, so we're really only, in a sense, uh, going to uh, scratch the surface. But um, forgiveness flows on beautifully from the two other words that we've looked at so far, righteousness um, and the gospel. And uh, our gospel is good news because there is a possibility of change. God can change us. He can change others through the gospel because it's a gospel uh, of forgiveness. And um, uh, Mr. Gupta, who wrote our, uh, our book that we're following his words uh, through, the, uh, through the book, um, he, he quotes a, um, a, a Greek man who was talking about um, what is the essence of forgiveness. And um, he quotes a book by a fellow called Kevin Andrews. And uh, Andrews was going uh, travelling around Greece um, studying uh, medieval fortresses. You know, some people have amazing jobs that they uh, get involved with in their lives. But uh, he came to a small village and ended up staying with the local priest. And uh, the priest uh, there, had uh, his house had been burnt down. So they were living, he was uh, invited him into his shed where he stayed. And uh, then gradually he learnt this man's story that uh, he'd had two sons who were involved in the resistance uh, during the occupation in World War II. And uh, both of them, uh, some of the villagers uh, uh, betrayed them and he never saw his sons again. And then uh, he was, after the war, he was living with a daughter and her son, and uh, again, local people who were part of the communist uprising uh, just came and shot his daughter and son in front of his own eyes. These were local people that he knew. And, uh, and this man, um, Andrew, spoke with the priest's son and the priest's son said, my father used to walk around the village saying, we've got to forgive. We've got to forgive because God has forgiven us so much. And some of the villagers would just laugh at him. But his son said, my father forgives and so he's free. This is the only way we can live. And... Uh, I believe each of us have got deep issues in our lives where God has forgiven us so much and he wants us to learn to forgive. Forgive, I tell them to forgive, this man said. There's, there exists no other way. And uh, we've all got situations that are so complex so intricate it's easy to say oh you've just got to forgive you've just got to forget about it and some of these situations are in incredibly deep and uh, and God wants to bring us out as, as it says in Psalm 66 12 we went through fire and water but you brought us out into a place of liberty a spacious place where we've been set free and I want us to think that forgiveness is not just about oh, ticking the box and that's over and done with, but it's about entering into a beautiful personal relationship with our God where he sets us free to live with him and to live with others. Another man said that sometimes you can think of forgiveness as just jumping over a little brook and he said, sometimes forgiveness is like trying to cross the Red Sea. There have been deep issues uh, in our lives. And this morning, I, I think we need a picture of what it means to forgive and to be forgiven. And uh, Jesus gives us that story in, uh, in Luke 15. We, we often call the story the story of the prodigal son. But really, Jesus began the story by saying a man had two sons. And so really, it's about three little pictures of forgiveness. 
both positive and negative. So let me read that uh, if you want to follow on in Luke 15, beginning uh, at verse 11. Jesus said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets, his whole livelihood to them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and he travelled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he'd spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and, and he had nothing, he began to be in need. And he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from his stomach, uh, to eat the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. And when he came to his senses, literally when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and, 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 and uh, saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And then the third character comes in. The older son was in the field. And as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing and he, he summoned one of the servants and questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him. And your father has slaughtered the flattened calf because he's got him back safe and sound. But he became angry and he didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you and I've, I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. The father says, son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And ultimately, all forgiveness has to spring from God himself, from God alone. I want us to see that really, in a sense, we can only forgive others because God has forgiven us so much and in the seeing the father in this story you see an amazing picture of the forgiveness of God and how this whole relationship with our God has been restored through his forgiveness you know God God is holy he can't overlook sin or pretend that nothing ever was done that was wrong He's holy, he's pure, but King David, back in the Old Testament, had uh, committed adultery and then he'd more or less murdered this woman's husband and he came to realise what he'd done and how wrong it was and he, he cries out to God in Psalm 51, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done what's evil Somehow he knew with God there was a possibility of forgiveness. And that can be in our lives we can start to see the depth of, of what we've done that's wrong. And I want us to see that with God there is this amazing possibility 
of forgiveness. Perhaps uh, David, King David was thinking about in, in uh, as it says in Numbers 14, where the uh, children of Israel had come out of Egypt, they'd come out of slavery, and there in the wilderness they start to grumble. They complain against Moses and, and Aaron who were leading them out. If only we'd died in Egypt and forgetting the misery that they were in Egypt. And, uh, and let's just die in the wilderness. And, and, and yet God was promising them the, this beautiful, fruitful land. And yet, you know, God says, why are they despising me? And Moses prays and he appeals to God. He says, Lord... You're slow to anger and you're abounding in faithful love. You forgive iniquity and rebellion. So David cries out to God because he believes that God is a forgiving God. That there is hope with God. As he says, I'm conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Forgiveness always begins in a sense with our sin, sin always, it's sin against God. First of all, the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart. And so all sin really is first of all against God and it needs God's forgiveness. You remember in the New Testament where um, they, these uh, friends lowered their friend uh, who was a paralytic they lowered him down through the roof so that Jesus could heal him. And Jesus says to him, first of all, your sins are forgiven. Jesus knows that our deepest need before any physical healing is that our sins would be forgiven. And, and the scribes looking on says, well, who can, who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God can forgive sins. And I, I want us to see that God is a forgiving God. He's got compassion for each one of us. He doesn't want us to live in this life where we condemn ourselves, where we condemn others, when we can come to experience his beautiful forgiveness. In Micah 7, he says, Who is a God like you, forgiving iniquity? and passing over rebellion. He delights in faithful love. He will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. It's a beautiful thing to think that God wants to deal with our sin. He wants to forgive us and to cast all our sin into the depths of the sea. There's a beautiful hymn that says, Great God of wonders, all your ways are matchless, godlike and divine. But the fair glories of thy grace, more godlike and unrivaled shine. Who is a pardoning God like you, Lord? Who has grace so rich and free? So what do we mean by forgiveness? If you look up the Zondervan Bible, Bible Dictionary, which I did, it says uh, forgiveness is the giving up of resentment or retaliation, the giving up of claims to be compensated for hurt or damages, whether it's property or our rights or our reputation. And in the story that Jesus told of the prodigal son, the father could have just thrown the book at the sun. He could have seen the sun in the distance and said, no way am I going to have anything to do with you anymore because of what you've done. But he was out there. It seems like every day he was looking because he saw him in the distance. It wasn't that the sun had actually knocked on the door, but he saw him a long way off and he runs towards him and embraces him. You know, as someone uh, said, he, he had to run to the sun before the whole community would stone him and reject him. He had to run there to protect him and, and bring him back into the family. 
So how does, how does God forgive us? He, he doesn't pretend not to see it. But in Colossians 2, 13, you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. And each of us has this enormous list of sins. I don't mean to be discouraging to you, but that's the way it is. We are, we are lost and we're a long way from God. We have this enormous list of, of sins. And it says, the Bible says, Jesus has taken that list and he's nailed it to the cross. He himself bore our sin on the cross so that God could be both just, absolutely just, but also the justifier of each one of us. And, and so here was this list that was like on our prison door. And until that list was paid for, we couldn't be set free. But now Jesus has taken that list and he's nailed it to the cross. And we have forgiveness through Jesus. He made us alive and he forgave us all our sins. <coughs> what does the word all mean? Well, the dictionary says all means that, that it includes everything and excludes nothing. And he has forgiven all our sins. You know, for a long time in my life, I became a Christian. I used to think, well, God's forgiven me for all the wrong that I've done up till now. And, uh, and then, but oh no, I've, you know, I've had a bad thought or I've done something unkind. And now I've got to wait till tomorrow to try and start all over again. And... And, and my life was up and down and, and God wants us to see that he, when he says he's forgiven all our sins, that's past, present and future, that we can be brought into a new life with him, reconciled to him, forgiven, past, present and future. For by one offering, he has perfected all those who are sanctified. And he says there in, in Hebrews 10, I will never again remember their sins. It's, it's not that God hasn't got the capacity to know our sins, but he chooses never to bring them up against us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's giving us a forgiveness that is eternal and irreversible. And... I guess the reason that I've wanted to share these things with you is that when we start to think about forgiveness and forgiving others, it has to flow from a heart that sees how much God has forgiven us, how totally he's forgiven us. I am the one, he says in Isaiah 43, I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. You know, as a, as a young Christian, um, this year it will actually um, be 50 years since Jesus came looking for me on campus and I gave my heart to Jesus. And uh, the man who helped me gave me a verse, assurance of forgiveness, 1 John 1 9, and I still... I learnt it, I memorised it, and it's been with me all these years, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God says he wants us to live in that assurance that he has forgiven, that God himself is faithful and just, and he promises to cleanse us, to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the picture of the loving father running towards his son. And I want you to have that picture of the loving heavenly father running toward you to forgive your sin, 
to welcome you back into his family. There was incredible joy in the father's heart. There was a great rejoicing in the whole household when the son came home. And uh, David writes of that psalm in Psalm 32, how joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. Here was the son, he'd gone a long way away. But David says, when I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. And uh, you can know that in your own heart when you're refusing. You don't want to admit that something's wrong and you're, it starts to ache within you. Day and night your hand was heavy on me and uh, my strength was drained. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and uh, did not conceal your iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. God longs for us not to try and earn our way into this living relationship with him, but simply to confess that I'm needy, I'm broken. I need your help, Lord. If we confess, if we agree with God that it's wrong, God promises to cleanse us and to restore this relationship. The son came to his senses, he came to himself. He repented, he turned. And the mark of, of true forgiveness is when there's been this turning, this acknowledgement of sin, if we confess our sin. Um, Mr. Gupta gives us three principles from, from the scriptures that God's forgiveness doesn't always prevent punishment. And uh, God can forgive us, others can forgive us, but we still may have to pay the consequences of what we've done. But uh, God's forgiveness expects repentance. When we're talking about this uh, true forgiveness involves a turning, a true acknowledgement that what we've done is wrong. And Israel often questioned and pleaded with a silent or an angry God. And we've got to be careful that sometimes we think that things are going wrong because God is against us. But God is never against us. He's for us. But there are going to be times where in his discipline, in his loving discipline, he'll take us through some tough times. Deliverance and freedom. He's come and he's reconciled us to himself. So my question, I guess, is have you, like the younger son, have you really felt the tears of joy, God's tears of joy upon you, that you've been reconciled to your heavenly father? Because he wants us to live in that certainty that he is running after us. He's running, he ran after us when we became a Christian, he's running after us every day that we might live in this amazing relationship, certain that we're forgiven because of his great compassion. But then we come to the third character, the older son, the older brother. Um, I'm, I'm the oldest brother in my family, so I've never had to experience it, but you that are younger brothers and sisters know what older brothers can be like. But Jesus felt it very important to say, it's so, it is very important to learn how to forgive. If, uh, he said in Luke 17, if, if, uh, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And I suppose I've had to rethink a lot of this coming from a background where we could be just very judgmental. And like the older brother, there could be this uh, resentment that here was someone who had 
just taken half the farm and lost it and, uh, and then comes back and the father welcomes him back. And, and, and there can be that deep resentment in our hearts. And God says you can't live that way. You've got to remember how much you've been forgiven. There were, we've had um, experience with narcissistic people who want to be in control. And, uh, and, and you go to point out their wrong behaviour and they say, you've just got to forgive. And it's a totally wrong doctrine of forgiveness because forgiveness is as a result of a true repentance, of a true acknowledgement that something is really wrong. And uh, so you're going to have relationships, situations where there are going to be people who do things against you who will never apologise, who will never acknowledge. In a sense, we have to, God is calling us to forgive, to not live in that resentment and bitterness, but we have to set up boundaries sometimes because we can't allow people to come in like that and control our lives. These are deep things, but there needs to be a forgiveness that may not result in reconciliation. But there's been a forgiveness from our part. Jesus told the story in Matthew 18 of the, of the, uh, the wicked servant. He summoned the master, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? The older son, it says, became angry and he didn't want to go in. He didn't want to enter in to the whole environment of forgiveness. And you're going to find that in family life, in, even in church life. People don't want to enter in to that environment of joy and forgiveness and reconciliation. Sometimes there's a deep resentment within our heart that he's just, it's like he's got away scot-free. But the grace of God is not fair in a sense. The grace of God is absolutely God giving us all that we don't deserve. And so God, God says just we've got to beware of anger, of bitterness. In Hebrews, it talks about a root of bitterness that can spring up in our lives. I'm sorry, might be getting a bit heavy, but we're all got to face these situations and, and, and come at it from the point of view of how much God has forgiven us that we can learn, even when people won't apologise, even when people won't recognise, we can't allow ourselves to be bitter, to be angry. We had to face a church meeting. God helps you in these things. We, we had to face a church meeting, not this church, but another church, where uh, we had to call to account some abusive, abusive behaviour. And uh, I wasn't, it was, uh, the, I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Monday night meeting. And, uh, and I got into the car to come home from work and I was feeling a bit sick in my stomach, thinking, you know, what are we going to say tonight and how are we going to have to call to account some issues that are not right? And, uh, and um, I, I turned on the engine and uh, through my Bluetooth on my phone came a, a message by a sermon by a fellow called Edward Orr on confession and forgiveness. And it just, it was almost like it just came out of nowhere. But it was, I just, as I, as I drove home, he was saying how if someone seeks forgiveness, there has to be a true, a genuine confession, a specific confession of what that thing is wrong. And uh, when I got home, my wife came out the back door and uh, to see me, said, you'll never guess who rang. It was one of the abusive leaders. And the abusive leader said, if I have done anything wrong, will you forgive me? 
trying to anticipate the meeting that night. And it was that little word if that God had prepared me for because there was no specific acknowledgement of what was wrong. It was if I've done something wrong. And then that same person would say, you've got to forgive, as though what they mean is you've got to keep on going as though nothing is wrong. That's why this whole thing of forgiveness, it's, it's, com it's complex, it, it's deep, that we've got to ask God for wisdom as to how to deal with these situations, to watch out in our own lives that it's so easily there can be built up a resentment and an anger. And it can happen in our families, in our marriage relationships, in our, in our church life, at, at work, in our work relationships. So I want you to see that we can't be like the older brother and stand outside. That there are going to be people in our lives that have done terrible things. But when there is a genuine repentance and a genuine confession, we can enter in with them and receive them and rejoice together for what God has done in their lives. Yeah, Mr. Gupta uh, finishes the chapter by talking about a, a Greek Orthodox practice where um, Orthodox Christians, they kneel before each other in this vesper of forgiveness, which, which he says sometimes it can become just an institution, but, but they ask and grant pardon. And then on the next day, the they, they go out and have a picnic and they all fly kites. And it's like a springtime because they've come and they've confessed their sins and their grudges and their resentments to each other and God has set them free and it's like a springtime and uh, resentment he says is so cold and like a spiritual winter but forgiveness means that the light God's mercy shines and it may feel like it comes at a cost to us but we remember the debt of love we owe to our forgiving God. So don't stand outside like the older brother. Jesus is saying, I'm offering forgiveness. Enter into the joy of this new relationship. And I think two passages that have just uh, helped me over the years to enter into this forgiveness. The verse that I memorized, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Whenever I would start to condemn myself, God would say, you've confessed it to me and I've cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And then Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And, and that's why we began with the forgiveness of God his amazing forgiveness toward us because that's what's going to keep us in the days to come from resentment and anger from the older brother syndrome in our lives when we start to see more and more his amazing forgiveness toward us and we need reminding every week and that's why Jesus gave us the Lord's table that we invite you to join with us around the table. Jesus uh, took bread, it says in Matthew, and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it, this is my body. And he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as we come around the table, we come to give thanks for Jesus that he has forgiven our sins. He's forgiven our sins and they're set, that's settled forever, for eternity. All my sins are in the deepest sea. If, if you've never perhaps come to that point in your life of coming to 
to the Lord, but you're still thinking about these things, we're just so thankful that you're here and just remain in your seat. But if we invite all who have come to know Jesus personally to join with us around the table as we remember his forgiveness for our sins. Let's come and remember him.